Hello and welcome to my Fortress of Wavebreak. After finishing up with New Dwarf City a couple weeks ago, I wanted to retire somewhere nice, and because the elves hadn't bothered to turn any of their forest retreats into seaside resorts, I decided to create my own. So I embarked in a perfectly nice little section of coast that had no issues at all, and went to work creating the House of Waves. As with all fortresses, the story of taking Wavebreak from a barren mist-filled patch of nothing to a grand seaside hotel was made up of multiple smaller stories along the way. In this video, I have compiled three stories. Attack of the Giant Agitated Animals, The Bunker Family, and The House of Waves, which together tell the story of Wavebreak from its rough beginnings to its also rough ending. I hope you enjoy them. As I went to work directing my little dwarves hither and thither, chopping wood, collecting it, and constructing the future foyer of my glamorous hotel, all seemed well. A beautiful herd of unicorns even wandered through the glade like some kind of beautiful vision. That vision turned out to actually be a horrific premonition, but we'll get to that. The first sign that we would have trouble with the local animals would be hard to miss, considering it came in the form of a pack of giant agitated fireflies. At first, it just seemed like they would be large, bright nuisances for my dwarves to deal with, but that all changed with the death of Muthcat the Crafts Dwarf. We then had to take them a bit more seriously, and with more of a focused effort, we killed the rest of the fireflies without a casualty. But with the lights of the fireflies dimming in the dirt, we had no time to celebrate our victory, or mourn Muthcat's death, because a flock of giant agitated albatrosses flew into our territory, and giant albatross beaks and talons seemed a lot scarier to deal with than some big gross bugs. I put all my efforts towards digging a space underground that I wanted to use as a bunker slash living and production area for the workers of the hotel, because it seemed like fireflies and albatrosses would be less of an issue ten layers below the surface. This theory was proven correct when three of my dwarves, who were not helping out down below, got torn apart by albatrosses on the surface, while my miners were safely digging away. With only three dwarves left alive, I instructed them to wall themselves into the bunker so they wouldn't feel tempted to go visit the wagon and have their eyes packed out. Trapping ourselves underground did come with a few downsides though, chief among them a lack of food. The one horse that had made its way into the bunker before it was walled off soon found itself on the wrong end of the butcher's shop, as my desperate search for a cavern layer in which to farm grew longer and longer. Eventually, filled up with horse meat, one of the miners revealed a cavern ideal for farming. We had to spend a bit of time wandering around collecting plump helmets to use as the basis for our farm. But before long we were self-sufficient, and could hunker down in the bunker until help arrived. Which it half did when a group of six migrants were pecked half to death by the albatrosses. The three that survived did have Uzal the weaponsmith among their ranks though, and he was a skilled fighter that could hold his own in an albatross fight. Uzal, alongside some of the warriors brought by the autumn caravan, eventually managed to wipe out all the albatrosses patrolling the air around the hotel. This victory was just as short-lived as the one over the fireflies though, as giant agitated masked lovebirds took the place of the albatrosses. As we attempted to make progress on the hotel, the masked lovebirds had other ideas, and slowly picked apart my dwarves. We went back and forth with them, taking out a couple for each dwarf we lost, but we still lost a couple too many dwarves to be comfortable along the way. Fortunately, a well-timed migrant wave reinforced us enough that we still had eight dwarves by the time the last of the lovebirds were killed. With the death of the final lovebird, we were then confronted with an agitated but fortunately not giant tiger, which was easily killed. But then, with the tiger out of the way, giant agitated wrens decided that now was the time to strike. They were weaker than the albatrosses and the lovebirds, but it doesn't really matter how strong you are, if you push someone into the ocean when they can't swim, they're gonna drown. When the wrens did swoop down and harass my dwarves as they worked in the hotel, they were generally killed pretty easily and by the time the last one died, we had managed to finish the first floor of the hotel despite their best efforts. The animals didn't seem to like our brief moment of success however, because after the wrens, we had to deal with back-to-back -back waves of albatrosses, that we dealt with even when they went 22 layers below the surface into our bunker, though all those albatrosses dropped us from 8 living dwarves down to 4. As the last albatross flew around, seemingly not wanting to die like his brethren, we managed to make some actual progress on floor 2. Plus, the first child of the fortress was born, bringing our population back up to five, before the expedition leader went berserk and got killed, dropping us back down to four. Eventually, when the merchants and diplomats swung back through for another autumn check-in, the albatross was tempted out of the sky and got itself killed. This might have been good news had the next set of agitated animals not been unicorns, whose hooves and horns demolished Uzal the weaponsmith and both the merchant guards. 
Now down to only three dwarves, and with a horde of bloodthirsty unicorns patrolling the coast, we once again retired to the bunker to wait them out. After over a year of waiting for some backup to arrive and take care of the unicorns, we finally got a migrant wave with ten dwarves in it, who, through the power of friendship and mobbing the unicorns, managed to kill the two that were keeping us penned in, which obviously cleared the way for another pack of five fresh and healthy, bloodthirsty unicorns to come terrorize us. Immediately I told everyone to head to the bunker, but four dwarves died before they could make the trip from the edge of the map to the doors of the bunker. With ten dwarves safely below ground, I drafted the majority of them into the military, and left them to train for as many seasons as it took for even more reinforcements to arrive. A couple months later we saw our opportunity, when more migrants came and we sprang into action, hoping to overwhelm the unicorns once again. While some dwarves were pushed into ponds and had mixed thoughts on their experiences with bathing, the mission ended up being a success, and from this point on we would no longer have to retreat and regroup, instead we would be bringing the fight to the animals so that we could begin making real progress on the hotel, which had stalled partway through floor 2. But just because we had reached 16 population and had a handful of well-trained soldiers didn't mean it would be easy. First we had the satyrs that killed two of our dwarves, then another pack of unicorns, then a giant agitated leopard, then a snail, and then a jaguar, and then we got to breathe for a little while and work solely on the hotel as nature took its time cooking up what to throw at us next. It ended up being giant wrens who killed some merchants, then horseshoe crabs that were more annoying than you might expect, then another ten giant masked lovebirds, then some lizards, then some cute little armadillo men, then a giant agitated cougar, and then a giant agitated tiger. We got another little break after that onslaught, where we managed to scare a necromancer away and put some walls on floor two. But before long, we were back fighting nature. Some satyrs, a tree, a jaguar, our own mental health, and then finishing things off with some iguanas, two jaguar women, three jaguar men, and five leopard people. Our population had dipped dangerously low in the middle of all that fighting, down to three, but our soldiers were skilled enough and the migrant waves were timely enough that we managed to keep going anyway. And even with all the fighting taking place, we had managed to finish the roof of the hotel, completing the shell. Apparently, being unable to stop our construction forced nature to completely give up on attacking us, because the five leopard people we killed were the last animals we had any issue with. Our hotel was constructed, and the animal war was over, and all it took was the lives of tens of dwarves, dozens of animals, and hundreds of trees. In the midst of all the animal fighting, on the second of our three retreats to the bunker, an unlikely family was formed. Carol, Kilob, and Olan the Child were cut off from the rest of the world, stuck putting ghosts to rest and smoothing out walls as they waited for reinforcements to deal with the unicorns up above on the surface. Apparently something about that situation was romantic to Carol and Kilob, because trapped down in that little bunker of theirs, they decided to get married, which turned out to be a huge mistake. The relationships between the three of them were certainly complicated by the fact that Carol was the expedition leader of the fortress, and had to get yelled at and cried on by his new stepson, who only saw him as a passing acquaintance. And while Carol and Kilob were happy moseying around the bunker with their heads empty, Olan was miserable, spending his days reliving the death of the former expedition leader Emush Channelhammers, and slowly slipping into a depression. Olan was given his own room across from his parents in the workshop hallway, but having your own space can only do so much when you're being haunted by your dead dad. And then things got even worse for Olan when Carol and Kilob had their first child together, Udib, and all of a sudden Olan wasn't the only one yelling at Carol anymore. Eventually, when the Bunker family was finally freed by some incoming migrants, Olan got lost in the chaos of a second unicorn attack, and was found dead on the beach, marking the beginning of the end for the Bunker family. Not long after Olan's death, Kilob had her foot stolen by a ghost, and was left immobilized and dehydrated in the dining room. With our access to the wagon outside blocked by a herd of very angry unicorns, we were unable to make a metalsmith's forge to make a chain to build a well to bring Kilob the water she needed, and so we all just watched as she died of dehydration. With these two very bleak and depressing deaths back to back, Carol was depressed and slowly began to struggle more and more as time passed and he relived the deaths of Olan and Kilob. Eventually, this became too much for him to handle, and he entered a berserk rage. Fortunately, he died before his rage could injure anybody, but unfortunately, death did not pacify him, and he came back as a ghost and attempted to steal one dwarf's heart and another's leg, which it turns out is pretty deadly. Once Carol was finally put to rest, all that remained of the Bunker family was little Udib, 
living in the bedroom of her deceased parents, and getting into fights. On the plus side, the death of her mom did lead Udib to find helping others more fulfilling. The moral of the story? Don't get married in a bunker. That's practically begging to have your child killed by a unicorn, your foot stolen by a ghost, and your eternal rage preserved in a murderous ghost. It's just common sense. With the shell of the hotel completed, and with no enemies to fear other than the ghosts of dwarves who got cursed for daring to get married in a bunker, it was time to decorate the hotel and turn it into a proper tourist attraction. That meant installing some walls, some furniture, and some doors to create the bedrooms that people would be staying in, as well as furnishing the foyer with the chairs and tables that people would need to be able to sit down and drink after their long journeys. A nice hotel on the coast just wouldn't cut it in this day and age though. Not when tourists could easily go visit a zombie-infested volcano, or a thrilling cavern tavern, instead of coming here. I needed to build something for the tourists to enjoy, and my first idea was a scenic lookout over the ocean. After chopping down even more trees and putting it together, we did manage to get a couple of guests coming our way. But they weren't really the kind of guests I was looking for, and so we just killed them instead. With the lookout completed, and no living guests to speak of, it was time to build a second tourist attraction, the Ocean Sifter Spa. The idea was that we would drain the ocean through a room with bars on the floor and protective bars around the outside, so that the water could go through and spray up some lovely mists for the dwarves to enjoy, before draining off the edge of the map. And anything large living in the ocean that found itself caught in the flow of the ocean sifter would be trapped in a metal cage for the dwarves' enjoyment. I spent far too much time setting up glass production that I only ever used on four semi-pointless windows, but other than that, the ocean sifter spa seemed like a huge hit among my dwarves. The only problem was that that interest didn't seem to really be translating into visitors. We hadn't gotten any migrants in a couple years, and after some merchants got killed by some animal or another, the merchants had avoided us, and I thought this might be connected to why we weren't getting any visitors. And so when they finally came back for the first autumn in a while, I took the opportunity to flex the wealth of the fortress a little bit, trading them gold for a random assortment of things. That seemed to do half of what I wanted it to do, because after winter, we started getting some massive migrant waves, first bumping us up to 31 and then 40 dwarves. Unfortunately, there was no increase on our zero visitors per year, or at least zero visitors who weren't dead or trying to raise the dead to destroy us. Dwarves were loving the scenic lookout and the ocean sifter spa, they were drinking and making merry in the tavern, and all the rooms were just waiting for guests, and still none came. We had elves within half a day's travel who had never bothered to make contact with us, and with no handout flyers mission type, it seemed unlikely that burning their forest retreats to the ground would turn them into paying customers. And so with years of missing guests weighing on me, I waited for the next autumn to roll around, and as the outpost liaison made her way into the hotel, I locked the doors behind her. She could be our guest, she could enjoy the tavern and the ocean sifter spa and hear stories about the scenic lookout she would never have access to. As long as she couldn't leave, our hotel would be fulfilling its purpose, and if I were her, I wouldn't expect any visitors to be coming to my rescue. Well, those were all very happy stories, and I can only assume they all lived happily ever after. I, of course, retired from my retirement at my seaside resort once we had a guest. I guess I've just got to keep moving on to bigger and better things. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.